And I make that comment because of the fact that I told Doug this, uh, you know, that when he was not here last week, all of a sudden we came out, you know, out from prayer. The door was still left open. The lights were still on and everything else. And Doug is usually the last one that turns off the lights and closes the door. We were just all kinds of messed up, you know. You know. And no, it's always the same way. It's like, you know, when, when, uh, when with some of our, you know, when our church family is on vacation, we enjoy the fact that they're able to be on vacation, be able to relax, be able to recharge and all those things. But know that we do miss you when you're gone. It's not like the fact that we're like, woohoo, they're gone, you know, we're excited about it. But the fact is, is that we miss you and uh, we're, we're glad to have you, um, you know, glad to have them back and glad to have those back uh, that have been, have been gone. Like I said, we're in Hebrews chapter 1. Last week we first, you know, we covered, the, uh, we did a little bit of the background of Hebrews chapter, uh, of the book of Hebrews, but also did like the first three verses. I'm going to, uh, we're going to read those verses again as we are going to go through uh, verses 4 through 14 this morning. But the, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1, the Bible reads, God who at sundry times in diverse manners spank in uh, time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the power of his word, when he had by, uh, by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto uh, which of the angels said he at any time, uh, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be uh, to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the uh, end of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son, he saith, thy, uh, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, forever and ever, a, uh, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand, thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they, uh, they all shall uh, wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shall, uh, shall thou uh, fold them up. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, should, uh, sit on my uh, right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And they, uh, and they uh, not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. Lord, I ask that you would give us ears to hear. And Lord, a heart that is uh, ready to receive your word, that, is, that the seed of your word would, uh, would fall upon the fertile, hearts, uh, fertile soil of our hearts. And Lord, I pray that this morning, that as we go through your word, that God, that we not only just hear it, but we also uh, would do your word in Jesus' name. Amen. First and foremost, I'm going to tell you the, the title of my sermon this morning because of the fact is, this flat out, you're going to see you know, throughout, you know, uh, throughout the book of Hebrews what is happening in this entire thing. Whether you believe that the, uh, Apollos wrote it or Barnabas or Paul wrote it, I personally believe that Paul wrote it because of the fact that it refers to Timothy. No other uh, New Testament writer even refers to Timothy besides Paul, plus the fact that it's written in the same form that he writes it, even in the fact the way that he ends it the same. Some believe that, that Paul, when he, uh, you know, that when he wrote this, is actually like sermon notes. That this is actually you know, Luke writing this, but it was him listening you know, to Paul and his sermon notes because of the fact that, it, that it, the way it starts off. It doesn't start off in a typical way that Paul writes a letter. 
Paul, you know, usually writes, you know, Paul, an apostle to whatever. But this one, right at the beginning, it says, God, who has sundry times and in diverse manners. I mean, he just begins to go and just lay right into it, right? He just begins to go. So the title of my sermon is this, because you're going to see this throughout the entire book of Hebrews, is that Jesus is better and it's not even close. Jesus Christ is better, and it's not even close. It's the, there's not even a close second in, the, in this manner. Because you know what? Hebrews teaches that Jesus is superior to the entire Jewish system, which offers nothing to benefit anybody in return. Because when we look at the Old Testament sacrifices, those were a foreshadowing of what Christ was going to do. You know, there was forgiveness of sins. There was remissions of sins in, in the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus Christ appeared in the Old Testament. And if you don't know that, because there's times where the Bible says, the angel of the Lord, that is referring to God being manifest in the flesh at that time. Plus, you go back to you know, Daniel, uh, you know, sorry, not Daniel, but Madrach, Meshach, and Abednego being tossed into the fiery furnace. And what does Nebuchadnezzar say? He says, you know, the man in, the, in there is the Son of God. So Jesus Christ is not just in the New Testament. He's not just something that came along, just was born, but he has always been, he always is, and he always ever will be. So he's always better, and there's nothing that's even close to him. Christ is better than the angels, as you'll see in chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 1 and 2, Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. His covenant is better. His sacrifice is better. His temple is better. These are all things you're going to see throughout the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better than anything, anyone, any place, and he's better than any covenant that was ever established. Jesus is better than anything we can create in our small, finite minds because he is the creator of all things everywhere. He is he has always been, he always is, and he always will be God. And no one can change, even if they wanted to, desire to, or think of something that they think that they can do better. They can't do any better. Why? Because you can't do better than the Creator. The Creator can never do better than the Creator. Hebrews deals also with the fact of power and the importance of faith. You're going to see the fact that faith trumps your works. It always does. And I'll just tell you this, I am glad that he is God. I am glad that I am a New Testament, Bible-believing Christian. I don't want to have to go through, you know, I don't want to go through the times of Moses where they're sitting there trying to think of, okay, I have to go do a sacrifice because I did this. Oh, man, I just came back from there. Now i got to go back over here again and do this again. i got to go over there and kill more of my livestock because I said something that I shouldn't have. And you know, i got to go do that. Or I thought something, i got to go back and forth. I am glad that I am a New Testament, Bible-believing Christian christian because of the fact that he is the better sacrifice he is the, the better covenant he is the better god he is better in every way shape and form that we could ever ask think or imagine you say well pastor are you gonna get to your sermon that's pretty much my entire sermon but i'm gonna go a little bit more in depth because he is better he is better and so some people will sit there and say, you know, why is the epistle or the, the, the letter written to the Hebrews instead of the Jews? Why isn't it written, you know, you know, the epistle to the Jews? Well, for one thing, Jews are from Judea. And they're often associated with the false religion of Judaism. There's a group of people called the Hebrews. And if you notice throughout the Old Testament, how are they, how are they recognized? Not as Jews, but as Hebrews and Israelites. It's not until later on that you, you begin to see Jews. Why? Because they're from Judea. The book of Hebrews is different in that it is written to a specific, particular group of people called the Hebrews. And it is not like other, uh, other letters or other epistles written to, uh, to a certain individual like Titus or Timothy or anything else, but it's also not written to a specific church. It's written to a, a certain group of people. And you'll never read... In the, uh, in the entire Bible where a Jew is saved and is then referred to, or they refer to themselves as a messianic Jew. You'll never see it. You know why? It's because once you're saved, you are a believer, you are part of the brethren. The Bible doesn't say that you're a messianic Jew. Why? Because you left that be uh, behind. The Bible says that you are neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female. Why? Because now you are in Christ. 
You are not identified by a false religion or an area. You are in Christ. I know that people say, well, I'm American. But first and foremost, if you're saved, you are a believer. That's how you are identified in the Bible. The Bible says that you are a saint of God, that you are a believer of God. Hebrews, you know, obviously is going to deal with the Jewish practices that were still being practiced out of ignorance. But remember, obviously, this book is, it still applies to all believers. He's going to go through all those practices that have nothing to do. And this is the reason why the Hebrew Roots Movement is stupid. I'll just tell you that right now. Because they want you to go back to the Old Testament. They want you to go back to the Old Covenant. And the Old Covenant is nothing compared to the New Covenant. Why would I want to go back to sacrificing animals and everything else when I have Jesus Christ, who is the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice? But the Hebrew Roots Movement will sit there and tell you, well, you've got to keep all of the, all the laws. There's like over 680 plus laws that you've got to keep. But Christ is the perfect, blameless sacrifice. And he's going to show that throughout the book, uh, book of Hebrews, who was... Offered once and for all, not over and over and over and over again. But here's the other part, you know, like I said, the, the false teachings and everything else, that they say that you've got to keep the whole law? What does the Bible say about that? What does the New Testament say about that? As a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, what does the Bible say? That if you offend, that if you mess up in one point, you're guilty of it all. Even the stuff that you don't know, that you did out of ignorance, that you didn't even think about, you're still guilty of it. Why? Because you have to keep the whole law in order to be perfect, and you can't do it. But yet you got Hebrew roots and these other false, you know, uh, these cults and false religions out there teaching that you have to do that. And the reason why, you know, also during this time, the reason why this is, you know, uh, most likely being written is because. It was because of uh, intense persecution from the Jews. You read throughout the New Testament, who's the, one, who's the body of, uh, you know, of people that is persecuting Christians? It's the Jewish people. There was intense persecution that was happening to the Jewish people on behalf of the Jews. And what they were trying to do was get, these one, you know, get the ones that had, uh, you know, that had changed and transformed to being Christians to go back to Judaism. To be, you know, so they would go back, so they would, you know, uh, you know, all of a sudden they would come back and they would have their little yarmulkes on, their little prayer shawls, their little thing, and there's their bobbing and weaving, and they're doing all this stuff that they got up there. And the thing is, the Bible says you don't do that anymore. Well, I, I believe the Bible doesn't say that you do any of that really in the first place. That's all stuff that has been added onto by Judaism, or as they've taken it from, which is the Talmud. And also the reason why is because they're telling them to stay away from these, the temple sacrifices. Why? Because this was written before the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And so there were temple sacrifices still going on at this time. And Paul, who, I, like I said, I believe wrote this letter, is you know, sitting there, you know, telling, or preaching this sermon, is telling them, you know what? Don't do it. Don't, you don't have to do that. Why? Because he is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ is that sacrifice. That's my introduction. Number one is this. As I said earlier, he is better than the angels. He is better than the angels. In verse 4 it says, being made, which is, is not saying that Jesus was being created because he is the creator, but is in reference to his reputation. It, it is in reference to who he is. In verse, uh, in verse 4, it says this flat out. It just says, he is so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Acts chapter, four, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says this. It says, Neither is there salvation in any, uh, in any other, for there is none, none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. If there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved, then why is it that we're trying to get there by uh, every other means? If Jesus Christ is who he says he is, then we don't need to you know, say, you know what, God, I need to work towards you because he did the work. He is better because we don't have to do the work. He did it all. He did that. 
he accomplished that. He finished that in his death, burial, and resurrection upon that cross. That's why when we go out and we preach the gospel to him, that's what we could try to get people to understand is that you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that in his death, burial, and resurrection, that that is enough to save you and get you to heaven. And yet you'll still have people that will come up to you and say, you know what, but i got to repent of all my sins. Or i, I got to attend church every single week in order to be saved. Or i got to do this or this. That is you trusting in your works to get to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That is, you put your full faith and trust that he is enough. That he is better than anything else. And even if you could you know, buy your works, the Bible says that your, uh, your works are as filthy rags. That nothing you can do, nothing, no amount of money, no amount of working, nothing is going to get you into heaven. It's by your faith alone in Jesus Christ. He is better than the angels. Angels can't offer that. And you ever notice how many false religions are started by a supposed angel coming, them, uh, coming to them and, and telling them, hey, this is a new way to believe? I mean, think about this. He is the heir of all things. He created and made the world. He upholds all things by the word of his power. That's powerful. That at any, just by him saying it, things exist. This is not, you know, like I said, you know, I believe I mentioned this last week. This is not about name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, stupidity the other that says if I lay my hands upon something, that God's going to give it to me because he owes me. God doesn't owe you jack squat. I'll just flat out tell you that. But God, you know, speaks things into existence. Why? Because he is God, and you're not. He is the exalted one. He is the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of God's glory. He's the purger of all sins. He is superior to the angels and to the prophets. Why is, why is Paul, in other words, why is, why, is, why is the apostle Paul flexing this way? Why is he flexing on the Jews this way? Because the Jews... And the prophets are who they relied upon. Anytime you look in the New Testament, they'll say, you know what? We, you know, we appeal to Moses, or we appeal to this prophet, or we appeal to this one. Paul, uh, Paul's like, you know what? They're nothing. They're nothing. You could sit there and, and talk about angels. You could talk about prophets. You could talk about the Old Testament system. and sacrifice. Paul's like, you know what? I'm going to flex on you and say, you know what? God is better. Jesus Christ is better. And the thing is, in fact, his name is more excellent and more powerful than any other name. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. It says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall, uh, should bow of things in heaven and in, uh, things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is uh, Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, the thing is, is that, you know what, you can sit there and say, you know, I don't ever want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. You're going to admit that he is Lord of all, whether you want to or all, you know, or want to or not, because he's going to make you do it. So you can do it with a smile on your face because you, you have trusted in him and you believe, and you do it out of the free will of saying, you know what, I want to do it. I, you know, I confess that he is Lord, that he is the name above every name. Or you can sit there and just grind your teeth and, and, and just get it out because the thing is, is that no matter what, you're going to admit it. And here's the thing is, is that the fact is proven from the scriptures. I mean, we see this in verses 5 through 14. In, uh, in verse 5, he says that his, his name alone is superior to the angels. His name alone is superior. The angels are commanded and obligated to worship him. They have no choice in the matter. They are commanded and obligated to worship him. He is the anointed king and the unchanging creator who is served by the angels. The angels serve him. And by the way, you know, here's the thing, is that Christians will go out and try to prove that the Bible is true, but do you know that the Bible never tries to prove God, exist, uh, God exists? It never tries to prove it. It actually just tells you this is the way it is. I mean, there's verses I can go through, and here's, uh, here's one in particular, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, For the invisible things of God 
from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He flat out tells them and says, you know what? God exists. He's like, I don't care what you think, what you say, whatever. God exists. That's what the word of God says. That's what the Bible says flat out. He doesn't sit there and try and mince words and say, well, you know what? Perhaps if you believe in God or perhaps if you believe in this God or perhaps you believe in No, he says, there's God. That's what God's word says. I mean, you can also go over to you know, uh, Psalm 19, uh, 19 verse 1 through 4. Uh, 1 through 4. I'm not going to read it to you. But the Bible doesn't you know, sit there in mince words. The Bible says, and never tries to prove that God exists. It just says, God exists. And here's the earthly you know, part. And the reason, this is the reason why I didn't necessarily you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, tell you this or, or go to every single verse. Because there's 4,000 different places in the Bible where it refers to itself as God's word to man. Do you want me to go to all 4,000 spots? We'll be here a while. But here's the thing. How can, how, how, how can we escape the fact about him that he is God and that we're not? You can't. You can't. There's people, you know, they're saying, I'm going to escape God, I'm going to get out of there. And there's this false teaching and this false thought that, that says that when we, you know, when a person goes to hell, that they are eternally separated from God. That's a lie. Because if they were eternally separated from God, then they would get relief from his punishment. You say, well, pastor, how do you know that? How do you know that God is everywhere all the time? Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Starting at verse 7, going through uh, verse 10, it says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the, inner, uh, the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. No matter where you go, no matter how much you try to escape God, he is there. There is no such thing as eternal separation from God. Because even in hell, God is there. Because he is the one bringing about the torment and the punishment and the wrath that are upon those people that are in hell. God is there. You can't escape him. So why does the writer of Hebrews make such a big deal about Jesus' Jesus' superiority to the angels, to Moses, to Aaron, the old covenant, you know, the sacrificial system, all that stuff? Because the Jews had still held, or held and still hold a lot of times in, in today, those areas in high esteem. That's why in the end times, when the third temple is built, it's because of this. They still hold that temple in high regard. In high esteem, they still hold the uh, you know the sacrificial system in high esteem because they want those. That's why the third temple is going to be built. People say, "Well, they don't really want it." Yes, they do, because you know why? The Bible tells me it does. It, it, it tells me that they hold it in high esteem, esteem because they want to build, and that's where the Antichrist is going to go in and declare that he is God. So, for people that sit there and say, "You know, they don't hold it," yes, they do. Yes, they do. And the, uh, the writer of Hebrews is explaining why Jesus, obviously, is, why Jesus is better than anything to encourage believers to stand firm in the faith when persecution comes. Because these uh, group of people, they were being persecuted by the Jews at this time, intense persecution. I'm not talking about somebody pointing and laughing at you. I'm talking about the, to the point of death, to the point of torture, to the point of all these things, that that's what's happening to them. And the Apostle Paul is saying, you know what? No matter what happens, no matter what persecution, no matter what happens, you better stand firm in the faith. You better stand firm in the faith. And he's not saying, you know what? Oh, because if you don't, you're going to lose your salvation. But the thing is, is that you're going to lose your testimony. Because if you sit there and you back up, you say, well, you know what? I, I'm sorry. I'll just, I'll go, I'll go sacrifice my goat. I go, I'll, I'll, I'll do those things because I, I don't want that persecution. You just lost your testimony. It's saying that, you know what, you're willing to give in. But if you stand firm in the faith and say, you know, I'm not going to do it because, you know what, Christ is a better sacrifice, you may get, you, you may get you know, killed because of it. But what does it matter? Because we're, as that death is but for a moment, you are instantly brought into his glory. That's why he is better than anything. That's why he is better than anything. And verses 5 through 10 
I'm not going to read it again, you know, uh, for the sake of time. But what we see in here is that angels are created beings. They are, they are not sons of God, as Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the reason why I bring this up is because there's this strange thing. If you ever watch like, the History Channel, the History Channel tells you everything but history. If you ever watched the, you know, the old series, there was a series called uh, Mysterious, uh, how was it? Mysteries of the Bible Explained. And it was basically how they could explain away everything that ever happened in the Bible. But on the History Channel, they have like ancient aliens. Oh my. I should just put it that way. Because on that show, they'll sit there and talk about how angels are aliens. They're not. Angels are not aliens. They're not 450 foot tall giants called you know, the Nephilim. They're not some weird hybrids of half human, half alien. They're not some half, uh, half human, half lizard, half whatever. I mean, all these stupid conspiracy theories out there. And you say, well, yes, the Nephilim, you know, they were 450 foot tall giants. No, they're not. The only way you can come to that conclusion is if you believe the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha is not in the Bible. And you say, well, the Apocrypha originally was in the King James Bible. They put it in the King James Bible to show people how stupid it was compared to Scripture, that it was, that had nothing to do with the Bible. And if you don't believe me, go back to, you know, uh, to the writers, and they'll tell you that's the reason why they put it in there, so you can see how much it does not line up with what the Bible says. But the thing is, is that in the Apocrypha, in the book of Enoch, it talks about 450-foot-tall giants that went around and whatever. And what ended up happening was that the daughters of man ended up sleeping with angels or the sons of God. I'm sorry, it should be the sons of God because that's what it says, the sons of God, and that they were angels. And they had these weird hybrids. And that's how they got these weird 450-foot-tall humans in which, you know what, they find bones of all kinds of animals, but yet they've never found one of a 450 tall, 450 foot tall human. Now the Bible does talk about you know giants, and it gives actually heights. Like Goliath, it actually talks about the fact that he was around nine feet tall, and we would call that a giant. That they're, they actually talk about the size of uh, the size of their beds. The size of their beds at times were 13 feet long. Far cry from the 450 foot tall giant that they're lying about. Yes, they were giants. And to me, who is five foot seven, looking up at a person that's nine foot tall, that's a giant. I have a friend of mine. He was one of my youth leaders, you know, in, uh, when I was a youth pastor in East Peoria. He is six foot six. I'll tell you right now, five seven, looking up, he's a giant. He ain't 450 feet tall, though. And so, in other words, the Apocrypha is trash. Don't ever read it. If you want to read it to get a laugh out of it or to see how wrong it is or anything else, then go ahead. But I wouldn't waste your time reading it. And here's the thing. You say, okay, well, then who are the sons of God that the Bible refers to? That's believers. That's believers. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, But as many as received him... Those who are believed on him, those are the ones who are saved. It says, to them gave he power to become what? The sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. We are the sons of God. Not that we're the son of God, but we are part of his family. That The Bible says that we are children of God. If we're children, then we are heirs of God. And then if we are heirs of God, then we are joint heirs with Christ. We have been grafted in into Christ. That's what the Bible talks about, is the fact that we are sons of God, but we are a part of God's family when we are saved. When we got saved. And here's the thing is, is that oftentimes people will go to Job chapter 1 verse 6 and say, well, this right here proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the sons of God are angels. Job chapter 1 verse 6 says this, it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And they'll go, see right there, Satan's right there, he's an angel. That means that technically that the sons of God would be, no, it doesn't. It does not mean any of that. Because the thing is, is that believers always come before the Lord all the time, 
And the thing, here's, here's the other part. If the term sons of God meant angels, then what we just read in John chapter 1, verse 12 doesn't make any sense. Why would John chapter 1, verse 12 sit there and talk about the sons of God being angels as those who have believed? Angels cannot believe upon the Lord. They can't be saved. So why would all of a sudden we, we sit there and believe it? And apart from that, every other place in the Bible where it talks about the sons of God, it is referring to believers. So this one instance where they want to you know, cherry pick Job and sit there and say, well, because of this right here, that automatically means that sons of God are angels. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Here's the thing. Satan still has access to heaven. Do you know that? Do you know that, that Satan still has access to heaven? You say, well, he's not saved. I know that. But he has access to heaven. Why? Because he's the accuser of the brethren. In Job, where we're just reading, what does he do? He goes into, he has access to heaven to where he goes in and he asks about, you know, uh, who he can go after. And God says, what about my servant Job? And, he's, and, and that whole story starts where Job loses everything. He has access to heaven just into certain parts of it. He only allows him to, you know, he only allows him to go into certain parts. And here's the thing. Satan still needs to ask permission from God to do anything. Do you know that? Or to allow anything. I mean, t- tell you how much on, you know, on a chain that God has Satan. He's carrying him around like a puppy dog saying, nope, you can't do that, or you can't do that, or whatever. He tells him what he can do, you know, what he has permission that he can do. He still needs to ask for permission. The only way to become a a son of God is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. No angel is ever called son or even, even referred to as my son as it does in these verses. This shows, the superior, uh, this, this shows that superiority that Jesus Christ is to the angels. It also proves, unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses wanted you know, to teach and believe, that Jesus Christ is not an angel. The Jehovah's Witnesses you know, believe that Jesus Christ is an angel along with Satan. And that they're, I mean, just all kinds of weird stuff. This is contrary to that. The Bible flat out teaches that Jesus Christ himself was not an angel. That he is the Son of God. The next part in there, it, refers, it talks about him being the first begotten. This doesn't refer to, this doesn't always refer to being born first, okay? First begotten means first in honor, first in order, first in authority. And in Revelation chapter 5, the angels worship Jesus. Again, Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus, uh, you know, in this case, the first begotten is, is, being, is being used of Jesus in this way to uh, stress his preeminence. And that preeminence means superiority over creation and over everything. He is preeminent over everything. He has superiority over everything. Colossians chapter 1, verse, verse 15 through 18 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be uh, uh, thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the church, uh, of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the, the firstborn uh, from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? preeminence or the superiority because he is superior he is better than all those things nothing compares to jesus christ nothing think about this in uh, ephesians chapter uh, 1 verse 21 it says far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in uh, this world which also in that which is to come he is far above all of that Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, and ye are complete. Who is complete? You are complete in him, which it says, which is the head of the principality and power. You are complete in him. Why? Because he is, he is head over all, of all power and principality and everything. Because of him, you are complete in him. You're not going to be complete. You are complete in him. Your body is going to you know, waste away and, and fall apart and everything else as we get older, right? But the thing is, is that 
That doesn't bother me anymore. Why? Because of the fact that when this body you know, lets me down and I go on to glory, I have a new body. Why? Because I am complete in him. Does that not cause you to be a little bit excited that it doesn't matter whether or not this body falls apart? Because it's going to? Oh, man, I tell you. Anytime in the Bible when someone other than God is worshipped, that man, that woman of God, instantly tells them to stop and worship the Lord. Do you know that? Anytime that somebody is even approached, and if it's not one, you know, if it's an angel, they say, you know what, get up, don't worship me. You know why? Because Jesus is the only God, and he is the only creator. He is superior. Pastor, why do you keep on harping on that? Because we treat Jesus like he's second rate sometimes. He is superior. He is better than every, anything else. And like I said, it's not even close. It's like, you know what? It's like the Harlem Globetrotters trying to go against the Washington Generals, and the Washington Generals actually think that they have a chance. There was one time where they won. You know what? Jesus ain't going to let Satan ever win. Let's look down at verses uh, seven, uh, 7 through 10, even uh, a little bit more. And like I said, angels are in service to God, and they worship the Son who is God. Revelation chapter 5, verse 13 says, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, Heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb forever and ever. And who, we, who is the Lamb that it was slain? Is the fact that it, John the Baptist said, it says, you know, it said that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So if Jesus Christ is better than all, if he's superior than all, and when he says, I can take away the sins of the world, do you think that he can do it and that he has done it? I mean, think about this. God calls Jesus God in verse 8. Thomas called Jesus God in John chapter 20, verse uh, 28. John, call, uh, John called, oh, sorry, Thomas called uh, Jesus God in John chapter 20. John called uh, Jesus God in John chapter 1, verse 1. And Paul called him God in Titus chapter 2 and 3. God called Jesus Lord here and describes the work of Jesus in creation. Jesus was the one that, at creation. He was the one in the garden. He was the one you know, that was going there when a man first you know, uh, sinned. And if we look at verses 11 and 12, it talks about the fact that creation is going to pass away, but he is eternal and unchangeable. Do you understand that? That no matter what happens, creation is going to pass away. It's not going to work. You know what? I'm going to tell you this. I believe in climate change. I believe in global warming. You say, well, where do you get that from the Bible? 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 says this. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Oh, there's that, you know, there's that, that global warming right there. The earth also and the, the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation or, or lifestyle and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the, uh, the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall uh, melt with fervent heat? Creation ain't going to last. Global warming is going to get the better of us. For those who don't believe on the Lord, you know why? Because in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and, the, uh, and today and forever. Jesus doesn't change. He is eternal. He is unchangeable. He is God no matter what happens. This world is going to fall, or, you know, fade away and going to burn up. But you know what? Those who are in Christ will not. Why? Because he is unchangeable and he is going to keep us with him and in him. Let's check out the verses 13 and 14 since it's been a while since I read those. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them 
who shall be heirs of salvation. Now think about it. How many times does the, does the writer of Hebrews say that? It says, and who says, and who says. It says, where at any time has it been said of this angel, and whatever. And the writer like flexes back and says, never, because this is what the Bible says. It says, no angel has ever sat at God's right hand. No, no angel has ever been God's first begotten. No, no angel has ever been God. No one has been Lord. No, none of them have been that. The thing is, is that he's quoting Psalm 110 here. And this psalm is quoted more than any other psalm in the, in the New Testament. And it obviously refers to the messianic reign of Christ in which Christ sits in power at the right hand of God. That he, in this first chapter alone, he's already just sitting there saying, you know what? No angel comes close or compares. Have you guys gotten that? Have you gotten the fact that Jesus Christ, that nobody is better than him? The angels, nor principalities, nor, nor Moses, nor the prophets, nor anything is better than Jesus Christ. Angels are powerful. I'm not going to deny that. Angels are powerful strength-wise. And also, they assist in delivering messages to God's people. And you know what? And they're going to continue to minister. And they're going to continue to help us as we are heirs of salvation. But here's the thing is, is that angels don't preach the gospel. They will help somebody, you know, they will, uh, they, they will help them to, uh, 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 to be open to it and everything else, but they don't do it. We do. We're the ones that are supposed to go preach the gospel. We are the ones to go see people get saved. Jesus Christ came to save mankind, not angels. They are a created being. Jesus is the creator. And obviously this morning, as we look at this, is that in, obviously in a very forceful manner, it seems that the writer of Hebrews, that the Apostle Paul has shown Jesus' uh, superiority to the angels, right? That he's, Jesus is the Son, not the angels. Jesus is the first begotten who receives worship, not the angels. The angels serve him. Jesus is God enthroned and anointed, not the angels. Jesus is Lord. He is Jehovah, who is the, cre- uh, the eternal creator, not the angels, who are all only created beings. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, reigning at the right, uh, God's right hand. Angels are but ministering spirits. And while angels certainly have a special play, place in God's plan for redeeming humanity, they are not to become the object of worship and adoration. How many times is more, are, is more focus placed upon um, an angel than upon Christ? Think about at, at funerals. Think about at funerals. What ends up happening at funerals is that somebody says, well, so and so, so and so uh, just got their wings. Or this and this, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Oh, one day I'll become an angel. No, you won't. Angels, like I said, have a, they have a, they have a certain place, a special place in God's uh, you know, plan for redeeming humanity, but they are not to be worshipped. There's so many times where people have pictures of angels on their walls and everything else. And all that kind of stuff. And the thing is, then they have this picture of a man who they say is Jesus, but is not Jesus. I mean, there's, there's pictures. I mean, the thing is, is that if we were to look at what the Bible says that Jesus would look like because of the fact of that he's, he came to fulfill the law and not to abolish the law, Jesus, for one thing, would not have long hair. Because the Bible talks about the fact of, you know, that in the, uh, in the Old Testament, oh, you know that Old Testament, talks about having short hair. It also talks about it having it in the New Testament and that ladies are supposed to have long hair and men are supposed to have short hair. Uh-oh. And then you go on to the fact that he's wearing like this big long dress, you know, beauty pageant sash, or they say, oh, it's just a, um, what do they call those things? Uh, a toga in which, or whatever it is. I was like, that's not a toga. That's a dress. And you can call it a toga. And the Bible doesn't talk about togas. The thing is that the Bible says that men are supposed to wear pants. Flat out it says it. So you got all these things going against, you know, these pictures, but yet people are like, that's Jesus. No, it's not. We don't know what he looks like. If you want to know what he looked like when, you know, when he got beaten and crucified, go look at Isaiah chapter 53. And where does it say in Isaiah chapter 53 that he had a countenance, he had a, a way about him that no one would desire him? So why is he some sort of like 
blonde hair, blue eyed, you know, fashion model. If the Bible says that nobody you know, would, you know, would think upon him as being like in that way, then why should we sit there and go, you know, have a picture of this, this fake one? And those oftentimes are ones you find in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is a, is a church of idolatry. It's a, it, it's a den of wickedness. You have, you have statues everywhere. And what does the, you know, the Ten Commandments say? Not to have any graven images. But if you go to the Catholic Bible, miraculously, that's taken out. All right. That's neither, uh, neither here nor there. But here's the thing. Is that Jesus Christ is better than all the pictures that we have, all those things. And as I've said to us, I think he is superior and it's not even close. Like I said, we are not to worship. We are not to worship angels. As Colossians 2, 18 and 19 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in, uh, in a voluntary humility or worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And not, uh, not holding the head for which all the body by uh, joints and bands have nourishment, ministered, and knit together, increased, uh, increases with the increase of God. In other words, why do we worship and adore angels when we have the Creator? Only Jesus Christ is worthy of such worship and adoration. Let Jesus and not the angels be the focus of our interest and our adoration. This morning, as I close, what I want to do, you know, first and foremost, is this: that if you've been uh, you've been believing the lie of all these false religions and everything else upon the world, and you say, you know what? But this morning, you say, you know, what? I see that Jesus Christ is far superior; that He is better than anything else, and I want to get saved. I ask that you either come forward, you would talk to, you know, that you would talk with myself, one of the deacons, whoever brought you, and we'll get you on the right path. Come talk to us. But the, one of the things that I want us to realize and know more and more is a song that we already sang this morning. But I want us to, you know, to realize that in the things that we just talked about of how truly great God is. And that when we, you know, when we sing this song here in a moment, I want us you know, to begin you know, to think about all the things that were just said this morning and begin to maybe reflect upon those things and say, you know what? I think I need to change my perspective. I think I need to change my object of my worship and realize that Jesus is not weak, but he's powerful and strong, that there's no one else like him, that he's better than anything you know, that we can ask, think, or imagine, and it's not even close. So for the next few moments, as we sing this song, I just ask, you know, I just ask that we begin to, to ponder and think those things. And if you want to sing and you want to worship, go right ahead. But if you want to get saved, like I said, come on up, talk to me as well. Talk to you know, those who have brought you. And we'll get you on the right track, ladies.